this is our 19th lesson in the series. Uh, historical development is what we're considering now. And we're leading up to, in our consideration of the historical development of this theology, uh, we have led ourselves here to the point of um, uh, Christian resistance and the American founding. And so I think from our founding fathers and from the theology that developed um, out of the American Revolution or preceding the American Re Revolution will help us in the formation of our own public theology, uh, helps us to consider, I think, um, uh, how we should think about these things as well. So I, th I think as we work through the history of this, uh, this little brief period in history, um, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's going to help us uh, synthesize some thoughts that we've been putting together now over several weeks um, with respect to this uh, theology. And we're going to look at that uh, this week, uh, and then one more week next week. And then we're going to uh, look at forming our own understanding of Christian resistance uh, in the weeks that follow. Uh, we'll do that from biblical texts and uh, put something in place for us uh, before we wrap up our study. Okay, so we've been tracing the historical development of political theology. I wanted to give us a, a very brief review um, to sort of orient our hearts and minds toward where we're at at this point um, and remind us of some of the principles that we've covered uh, so that we can look at the American Revolution and sort of that, uh, that patriot, those patriot pastors during that period of time uh, and see those with, uh, I think, a, a, through a biblical lens or a biblical filter. So we began with the early church. Early church living under severe persecution from civil authority. The early church was compelled under that persecution to consider uh, the relationship of the individual Christian or the church to the state. Uh, they were compelled, as it were, to develop their theology of public life. Um, and a proper understanding of our biblical responsibility to uh, be subject to governing authorities. They were working that out under persecution. Uh, and disciples of Jesus Christ must learn how to navigate our relationship to a hostile and tyrannical civil authority. Um, the hostile relationship uh, caused by the tyranny of Rome in enforcing uh, Curias Caesar, Caesar is Lord, uh, to which believers could only respond, Curias Jesus, Jesus is Lord. And we took a look at that from Scripture and the example of that uh, from Romans. Um, that was in the period of the early church. Several key principles were established during that period. One, government is not absolute. Romans 13 does not teach absolute obedience to governing authorities. We're going to look at that again. Therefore, uh, our subjection to government, because government authority, civil authority is not absolute, our subjection to civil authority is not absolute. We have one who has a, a complete authority. All authority has been given to him. We are to subject ourselves to him, absolutely. Government does have a legitimate authority, but it is a limited authority. There must be maintained a distinction then between church and state. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, okay? We move then from the early church to the fourth century where we talked about Constantine, um, Augustine, and the Donatist controversy, if you remember those terms. Uh, this period would begin a, a centuries-long tug-of-war during the medieval period, uh, that tug-of-war over the jurisdictional boundaries of church and state, with both church and state during that pe period exceeding their God-given jurisdictions. I uh, would go one way and then go the other. There was great tension between church and state. Augustine, if you remember, wrote his um, large treatise called City of God. A city of man was established or inhabited by depraved men uh, given to their lusts, whereas the city of God inhabited by genuine Christians who needed no civil authority. <laughs> um, and now the problem would be which authority then between the city of God and the city of man, which authority would ultimately um, lead? <laughs> Uh, which would be ultimate. So each had a sword, Augustine would say, uh, the one civil, the other sword ecclesiastical. That was the sword of their authority. It was called the two swords theory. It wouldn't take long before um, professing Christians under a, a growing Roman Catholicism would um, claim the power of both swords for themselves um, and uh, would compel men by use of the sword uh, with force. And so ecclesiastical authority in particular during this period of time uh, began to wield the power or the sword of civil authority in order to um, exercise um, 
sway over uh, the people, uh, and that was done, I think, um, very unbiblically, with the, the ecclesiastical authority overstepping its bounds. Uh, soon it would be the state that would do the same thing, and before long, uh, you have severe persecution again of genuine Christians, uh, one on the part of the, the church and the other on the part of the state. Uh, added to our list of cre- key principles that came out of that period uh, was the concept of soul liberty or liberty of conscience, that true worship could not be compelled at the tip of a sword, that true worship um, was voluntary, was to be offered freely, willingly. Um, and from that concept of soul liberty and liberty of conscience uh, came uh, the idea or the notion of spheres of sovereignty, uh, the s- the spheres in which the state could exercise authority and spheres in which it was uh, inappropriate for the state to exercise authority. And these discussions began to take place, um, many others, over the course of a thousand years, essentially, during the medieval period, right? So we considered then the medieval, me- medieval period through the time of the Reformation, where there was, during this period of time in particular, in the 12th century, a revival of um, Aristotle's thought on political theory, um, on government. Uh, those thoughts of Aristotle were sort of um, reinvigorated and um, filtered through a biblical lens by Thomas Aquinas. And the key principles that came out of that period were a developing theology of natural rights or um, natural law that provided for natural rights. Thomas Aquinas took those, uh, that concept from Aristotle and um, thought of that in terms of the biblical truth associated with it, which is that we have God-given rights. We are subject to God through natural law, that law that was written upon our heart, um, written upon the heart of man at creation. Uh, we are to be subject to him. And because God is our creator, do the creator-creature distinction, God has given us rights, inalienable rights, God-given rights, and those rights began to take shape during this period as life in particular, liberty, and at the time, property. Uh, Later would be known as a pursuit of happiness in our founding documents, Uh, but the right of property initially. We saw that exemplified in the writing of the Magna Carta, for example. Uh, where people began to assert themselves against the um, absolutism of the king. And so there were feudal lords who resisted. And it was the basis of that resistance was biblical texts, um, where they thought um, that the king had encroached upon their God-given, unalienable rights, and so resisted the king. Uh, An example of that in the Magna Carta, if you remember. All right, then we looked at the period of the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther updated the theology of Augustine, and wrote rather uh, than of two cities, the city of God, city of man, Luther spoke in terms of two kingdoms, both under the rule and reign of God. Uh, right-hand kingdom, spiritual, invisible, eternal. A left-hand kingdom, physical, visible, and temporal. Reformers saw the left hand, if you remember the, the sheep and the goats, right, from Matthew 25, and the right hand, those of God's kingdom, uh, he ushers into his presence. Those on the left, he casts out. Uh, The the reformers saw the left-hand kingdom as needing, requiring, necessitating both civil and ecclesiastical authority, Uh, but the reformers with with, um, still uh, too much continuity with their Roman Catholic upbringing and coming out of Roman Catholicism, too much continuity between Old Testament, Mosaic Covenant, theocratic structures, and New Testament, the New Testament church, um, the relationship between church and state was confused, uh, confounded, and abused um, by even the reformers during this period of time. And Luther's theology even allowed for the formation of state churches, which we'll see very soon after the Reformation, exceedingly soon after the Reformation, turn into um, just wicked, deplorable um, weapons of the enemy to persecute genuine Christians. Key principles added to our understanding from this period, uh, the covenantal view of government uh, as opposed to the absolutist uh, view, the divine right of kings. Um, and inc- incidentally, if you, if you hold to a covenantal view of government, then you, um, of necessity, hold to a covenantal view, if you will, of Romans 13. 
If you, for example, hold to an absolutist view of Romans 13, that we owe obedience to the government in everything that the government says, then you would also hold to divine right of kings in an absolutist form of government. Um, so this, uh, again, in thinking of Romans 13 rightly, um, the covenantal view of government took more shape, uh, gained more of a foothold, and began to be pressed by the people. Uh, all governments involve a covenant between God, the rulers, and those governed. And when we talked about those two covenants that are a part of a covenantal view of government. Um, the logical conclusion of that thought, then, if you hold to a covenantal view of government, where government is in covenant with God, and in covenant with the people, then naturally what flows from that, logically what flows from that, is a representative form of government. Uh, the government uh, governs at the consent of the people. The people put a governor or a monarch in place, for example. And so they rule at the consent of the governed. And what you have that sort of logically flows from that then is representative government. And we'll see that in our founding here soon. Uh, lastly, during that period... We developed a, a third cause for resisting civil authority, a third cause then for resistance. If there was this covenant, um, this, this, this mandate to rule justly under God and before God with accountability to God on the part of civil authority, um, if there was a mandate for governments to rule in that way, then governments that did not rule that way were tyrannical or oppressive or abusive and should be replaced. So um, we resist civil authority, one, when the government commands something that God forbids. Secondly, when government forbids something that God commands. But now this third developing uh, reason uh, for resistance to tyranny, resistance to approaching uh, oppression, is when government or civil authority exceeds the jurisdiction of its God-given authority and treads upon or encroaches upon the authority of another. And when civil authority begins to do that, uh, Christians, as it began to be thought, uh, have not only the right, but the responsibility biblically to resist. And we're going to delve into that uh, far more deeply as we look at the American Revolution here soon. Uh, so after that period, uh, the Reformation, really immediately after that, came the, uh, the English Civil War. Incidentally, the English Civil War was between uh, royalists on one side who held to the divine right of kings. Um, uh, absolutist view of Romans 13, that we owe subjection in entirety to the king, no matter what it is, and parliament, uh, parla parliamentarians on the other side um, who believed in a covenantal view of government, who believed in representative government, um, and would hold a, a covenantal view, if you will, of Romans 13. So immediately after the Reformation, um, um, once uh, sort of Roman Catholic Kings are being ushered out of England. Um, you have this, I mean, English Civil War that breaks out between royalists and parliamentarians. Uh, soon after the Glorious Revolution, where James II, II is ousted, William and Mary take over. William and Mary are hold a covenant view of government. They believe in religious freedom for Protestants. And uh, so um, uh, issue an edict of toleration. Uh, at the same time, this is going on in Britain, and they're ushering in a more covenantal view of government. Wars of religion are taking place in France, and the Catholics are winning and holding to an absolutist form of government, uh, persecuting uh, the Huguenots, the French reformers at the time. And all of this, uh, during all of this upheaval, uh, you begin to see the writings of John Locke. And John Locke becomes a really important figure for our founding. Uh, our key principles under the writings of John Locke now begin to synthesize, come together, begin to take shape, and that becomes really important across the pond where uh, a new government is, is beginning to be formed, okay? And I want us to understand this morning how that took place because I'd like for, for all of us to have a right, uh, I think, uh, right understanding of the American Revolution. So I want to walk us through that briefly um, so that we can sort of be on the same page with it. Um, under the writings of John Locke and those key principles being synthesized now, pulled together, um, we can summarize them, if you will. The authority of government is not absolute, okay? There must be a distinction between church and state. And incidentally, Baptists are the only ones who held to that distinction, right? That is a Baptist distinctive uh, separation between the 
civil and ecclesiastical. And we see that clearly in Scripture. Um, men are free. <laughs> men have soul liberty, liberty of conscience. Neither the church nor the state can compel conscience. Who is the only one who can compel, can compel conscience? The Lord Jesus Christ. All authority has been given to him, right? We have God's word. God's word compels conscience. Um, the state nor the, gover uh, the government nor the church uh, can compel conscience. The government, which is instituted by God, is at the consent of those governed. It is therefore a covenant with God and a covenant with those governed. It is a covenantal form of government, okay? Uh, that covenant involves the protection and the preservation of unalienable rights or natural rights given us by God. See how all of these principles now over 1,500 years of, you know, 2,000 years of development are all coming together. Do you see? Um, all of these principles now are beginning to be employed together. With that in mind and under the writing of Locke, government is tyrannical and government is therefore evil, not a minister of God for good, but a minister of Satan for evil when it violates the terms of that covenant and that government that is tyrannical should be resisted or abolished by the people uh, and replaced with another that will fulfill its God-given mandate, right? And we looked at how that was reflected, the writing of John Locke in particular, how that was reflected in the Declaration of Independence with Thomas Jefferson, okay? And we did that, um, I believe, last week. Thomas Jefferson writing a defense, if you will, for uh, revolution, all right, we arrive now at the American Revolution, okay? And I want to give us a brief summary, very, very brief 30,000-foot uh, overview of sort of why the revolution took place. And I want to give you some, um, some biblical uh, background uh, with uh, one pastor in particular during the time that was writing in support of um, the revolution, okay? So um, I think that considering or thinking through the American Revolution is really important for uh, us thinking through our own context today because the, the arguments or the, the biblical justification, the biblical foundation for revolution at the, time, at the time of the American Revolutionary War is the same biblical foundation on which we would consider resistance to tyranny or, or oppression in our own day. That tyranny, that oppression may take different forms and shapes, um, but it's no less government overreach, no less governmental tyranny or no less governmental oppression today uh, than it was back then. Uh, just uh, takes different shapes and forms and it, it, it provides for us at least, I think, a framework for thinking through our context today and this, um, what has become a, a slowly, it seems really fast to me, um, maybe a less slowly, more quickly, uh, encroachment of civil government on our personal rights and freedoms and our, our unalienable rights and freedoms, those freedoms given us by God and the responsibilities given us by God that government continues to encroach uh, into and um, at some point, at some point, and um, I'm not sure where that is, and you know, if you read um, Francis Schaeffer's uh, Christian Manifesto, Francis Schaeffer talks about the bottom line, right? The bottom line. And we don't know exactly where that bottom line is, but we're approaching it, right? We're, we're, it, it seems like uh, every day that goes by, we're taking another step closer. Um, and where that, it, it doesn't appear that that's going to stop. It, it appears that it's going to continue. And so what are Christians to do and how are we to respond? I think the, um, the American Revolution at, at least gives us a framework through which we can think about those things, uh, which I think is helpful and important, okay? Um, okay. The American Revolution had both a biblical and a constitutional foundation for resistance. And when I say both biblical and constitutional, the constitutional foundation for resistance during the American Revolution was based upon a biblical, found, a biblical ground, a biblical foundation, okay? So um, using, um, again, thinking through a theology of Christian resistance that's been developing now over 1,500 years, thinking through a theology of Christian resistance, our founders began to uh, develop, uh, in this case, uh, there was parliament in England that started with this, 
um, const- a constitutional basis for religious freedom, and that constitutional basis for freedom was being violated. And so the American colonies then had both a biblical and a constitutional basis for revolution. We find ourselves in the same situation today. Um, there is both a biblical foundation or a biblical basis for resistance, Christian resistance to tyranny, and being citizens in this country, we also have a constitutional basis for resistance to tyranny, tyranny and oppression in our um, government today. And so uh, a lot of times um, those two things are, are blended somewhat. You'll hear both biblical and constitutional arguments being made. If you remember um, John MacArthur and Grace Community Church, um, when the government began to um, invade, as it were, our, uh, their rights and liberties there, and the church began to um, uh, resist, uh, you heard, uh, for example, uh, Pastor John MacArthur um, talking about um, biblical reasons for that uh, from the pulpit, rightly so, uh, but what are they doing in court? They're arguing constitutional, uh, a constitutional basis for defending their rights and freedoms given to them by the Constitution. It, it's both. Uh, not, it's not an either or, it's a both and in, in terms of our situation today. And that is because, one of the reasons um, that is, is because our Constitution is founded upon biblical principles. Um, and so the, 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 our Constitution's preservation of unalienable rights is founded upon uh, biblical principles, okay? Uh, and all of that is founded upon rejecting an absolutist view of Romans 13, that we owe unquestioning obedience to the government at all times and upholds a covenantal view of civil government. Okay, let me give you an overview of the revolution, okay? Uh, we're going to over, give an overview of the revolution. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time, um, probably this weekend, some next week, giving a biblical argument for Christian resistance today. Um, and then I wanna, we want to take how that biblical argument for Christian resistance was applied during the time of the revolution and take a look at that so that we can wrap up our study with our own uh, thoughts on that, okay? If that makes any sense at all. Let's begin with an overview of the revolution. All right. Why did the revolution take place? Uh, Was it an example of Christian resistance or was it merely a bunch of rebels (laughs) who uh, acted in violation of Romans 13 and took matters into their own hands and um, resisted a duly appointed uh, civil authority? Uh, Much depends, as you can imagine, on our answers to those questions, right? It's very important to to, uh, understand and answer those questions. First, the American colonies had a constitutional because it was biblical, had a constitutional right to resist. And it wasn't our constitution. Our constitution hadn't been formed yet, but think with me about what that constitutional basis was, okay? As the colonies were being established here in the 17th century, right? The uh, war for independence uh, took place in the 18th century. We're talking about the 17th century now, right after the 16th century and the Reformation. So the Reformation is still blazing, blazing in Western Europe. Um, And taking foothold here, uh, as the colonies were then being established during the 1600s, um, each of the colonies being established was given a charter by the King of England. At this time, it was King George. I think George II and then George III. So the colonies were were given a charter by the King of England. And the charter um, provided for direct rule by the king. The king was the ruler. And the charter given by the king to the colonists provided for local government. Okay, so the king directly ruled over the colonies. The colonies uh, were then to have their own governor, a royal governor, if you will, that reported to the king. And then the colonies were allowed to establish their own legislatures. So king, governor, legislatures in the colonies. All right, this was different from government in England because there was the king in England and then the parliament in England, and the parliament was representing the people. So you had the king, um, the parliament um, supporting, if you will, the king or reporting to the king, and the parliament represented, uh, representing the people. So in the colonies, this, the king was their civil authority. Uh, the king represented, uh, was represented in the colonies by that governor, and the charters stated that the colonies could have their own representative legislature. The first of those legislatures uh, was the House of Burgesses in Virginia in, um, what was the date, 1619. Uh, Burgess, uh, Burgess is uh, a citizen. 
someone who um, lives in a borough and is responsible for um, submitting to um, a Burgess or a, a legislature or a government in that borough. So the House of Burgesses is representative, a representative legislature. The very first one, 1619, established in Virginia, that House of Burgesses didn't wasn't responsible for reporting to Parliament in England. They were directly reporting to the king, okay? Uh, the Parliament was an entirely separate body. Okay, um, England had their interests represented in the English Parliament. The colonists had their interests represented in the legislatures of each of these colonies. That makes sense so far? Okay. Um, both of those, Parliament over in England and these individual legislatures in the colonies, um, reporting directly to the king, okay, under the, the ultimate civil authority of the King of England. All right, from there, once this begins to be established in the 17th century, there's turmoil in England. Um, English Civil War, again, between royalists supporting Charles I, parliamentarians uh, under Oliver Cromwell, uh, supporting um, uh, representative government or a covenantal view of government, parliament. The armies of parliament would eventually win out uh, Charles I would be beheaded under Oliver Cromwell, uh, kicked out. Uh, Charles II would be kicked out. James II, a Roman Catholic, would also be, be kicked out before William and Mary would finally take uh, uh, rule, William the king. Uh, all of that, though, that, um, well, under Charles I, uh, Charles II would be brought in. James II would be brought in. None of that was going to last. Um, Charles II was brought in under a, an attempt to restore the monarchy in England, um, succeeded by the Roman Catholic James II. James II dispo, depo, deposed uh, in the Glorious Revolution, 1688, 1689, uh, right when our confession was written. Uh, all of this against absolutism or against tyranny. Um, and at the same time uh, that was taking place, there is the state church in England being formed, the Anglican church uh, that is taking root. Um, so more problems per persist in England under a state church. Parliament in England began to take more control, more direct control over the affairs of the state. Um, things that the king used to be responsible for, now parliament is taking control of that. However, the colonists, as the colonies were growing over here, uh, the colonists were reporting to their legislatures. The legislatures were um, taking care of civil government here and reporting back to the king. Each had their own, the colonists here, each had their own parliament, so to speak, right? A representative government for the people reporting to the king. So when the English parliament, if you can see the two, the two um, setups, if you will, the two structures, King, Parliament in England, King, Legislature's people in the colonies, these two separate forms of government, if you will, when Parliament in England um, decided to impose taxes on the colonies uh, in America, um, the colonists rightly said, you can't do that. Right? The, the colonists rightly said, you can't do that. And that's where the, the phrase, uh, no taxation without representation, is born. Right? Um, the colonists are saying, we have our own legislatures. Our own legislatures are representing our own people. They're going to be taxed to our own legislatures here. You have no authority with which to tax. If you can imagine, uh, for example, you're sitting in your house or you check the mail, and in the mailbox you get a bill from Canada. And uh, <laughs> those rascally Canadians. <laughs> they decide they want to pad their coffers and they're going to take uh, taxes from you. It's not going to be, you know, how much or how little it is or whether you can afford it or not. The issue is whether they have a right to do it and Canada doesn't have a right to tax you. And so the colonists constitutionally said, no, wait a minute. Parliament has no right to tax the colonies. We have no representation in Parliament. We've got, we've got no relationship to Parliament. We have our own legislatures, okay? So that's where the the conflict began. Um, the colonies rightly resisted or refused um, encroachment by English Parliament over their affairs. Now, let me ask you, um, who are the rebels? <laughs> right, who are the ones upholding the Constitution? Who are the ones upholding the law? <laughs> 
the American colonists were upholding the law. The American colonists were upholding the Constitution. This is the English Constitution, the direct charters given by the king. Um, the colonists responded, you're not our legislature. We have our own legislature. By charter, we report directly to the king. Their commitment was to the king. Eventually, King George III was the one who was named in our founding documents. The charters for each colony secured this right. Parliament was not honoring the rule of law. The colonies, the colonies were the ones who were upholding the rule of law. Uh, and King George, weakened by Parliament in his own country, uh, was not keeping his word that he gave in the charters. Uh, King George was not protecting, preserving, or upholding uh, the rule of law that was established in those charters. Okay, so here's the issue. The resistance of the American colonies was a constitutional resistance and a biblical resistance, right? Constitutional, because the colonists were the ones upholding the rule of law against those who were being lawless. It was biblical in the sense that that's tyranny. <laughs> that's the exercise of authority outside the jurisdictional bounds of that which was given them by the people, essentially, that authority that God had given them to rule, um, they overstepped their bounds, uh, over, uh, uh, overreached, as it were, um, onto, into the authoritative or the authority of another, into the jurisdiction of another. And that become the third reason for resistance, um, resistance to tyranny. Uh, resistance to oppression. The English Parliament took for and there, the, the English Parliament did that in many ways. The English Parliament did that with respect to religion. R why were many of the colonists here in the first place? Because they were fleeing religious persecution in England and in other places, but in England, uh, and that by the state church in England. And so many of the the colonists were here for religious freedom. And then what happens is they follow them across the pond and begin to. Um, want to encroach or uh, spread tyranny and oppression here. Um, so the American colonies had a constitutional basis and a biblical basis for resistance. Parliament was encroaching on their rights, their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We can, we, there were many ways in which that took place. It wasn't merely no taxation without representation. No taxation without representation was a clever way of like slogan, putting a slogan on the whole thing. Um, but that wasn't the only reason that the colonists were resisting, okay? Rights uh, had been given them by God. Those rights were codified in the English Constitution, those colony charters. Uh, in other words, the rebels were the majority in the English Parliament who were trying to ignore those charters given by the king in a power grab across the pond. They were ignoring English constitution and ignoring um, charters that were written by the king. Who were the rebels? English parliament. The English parliament were the rebels, okay? Um, the biblical basis was that the tyranny that existed over there <laughs> was unwanted here. And so what did the colonists then rightly do? They'd already resisted in England. They had already fled persecution. And now having followed them across the Atlantic, what were the colonists forced to do? The colonists were forced to defend themselves by fighting, defending themselves with force, okay? And we've talked about it briefly. We're going to talk about it more. But those three options that we have, right? Protest or resist, um, defend uh, or flee persecution, and then defend, fight, right? Uh, the three reasons or the three options really that we have biblically uh, to defend ourselves. Um, we have established constitutions in place. We have established governing authorities in place. We has, have established offices and ways and means of executing those offices. So, so think with me, okay? Established civil authority, established constitutions in place, and then we have offices that are put in place to uphold that civil authority, to uphold the Constitution, to work or enact government, okay? Therefore, um, in the minds of patriot pastors at the time, and we'll look at some of their writing, when someone who occupies a position of authority within that established structure, right? We have a civil authority, 
we have governing uh, uh, offices, we have a constitution. When someone occupies a position within that structure, that established structure, that established civil authority, and that person goes beyond the jurisdiction of their office or goes beyond the mandate of their office, goes beyond what they were called, elected, appointed to do, or acts in ways that are contrary to the established mandate of their office, the established rules, if you will, or laws governing their office, then that one who holds that office is the rebel, right? Not the person who resists him, but the one who holds that office. So think with me about this. This is an important point, right? This is, this is um, the way that the colonists were thinking. Uh, today, uh, we have, for example, a mayor in Oviedo, all right? That that mayoral office is governed by a job description, by laws. Uh, they have a mandate um, to uh, execute um, the duties of their office faithfully according to the Constitution, faithfully according to the laws, the laws of our federal government, the laws of our state government, uh, the laws of our civil, our local civil government. They're to execute their office in accord with the law. Well, if that mayor in Oviedo um, takes upon herself uh, to, by executive order, pass some law that is contrary to the mandate of her office, the constitution of our federal government, state governments, local governments, does something contrary to the established system, then who's the rebel? She is. And what is the, not only the right, but the responsibility of the people is to resist that unlawful and tyrannical exercise of authority. Do you see? Um, it's not the, the, the people in that case are not violating Romans 13. What are the people doing? The people are upholding Romans 13 because who is the violator of Romans 13? It's the per person in that office, right? So the, the colonies, the colonists in their thinking drew a distinction between established government, established civil authority, established constitutional structures, whether it was um, a monarchy, a parliamentary, you know, parliamentary form of government, a republic like we were establishing here, whatever the case may be, it didn't matter. Um, we're looking at the established forms and structures of civil authority. And when someone who held, that, uh, held a position of authority within that structure acted contrary to the mandate that they'd been given, that person was the rebel, not the one who resists him. The one who resists him is the one who is upholding Romans 13. That person is the one who is violating Romans 13. Does that make sense? All right, so that's the way the colonists were thinking. Um, and that's, frankly, um, that's why a, um, a, a, for government to be effective, for government to last, it requires um, a populace or a citizenry that pursues virtue, biblical virtue, frankly, but pursues good and not evil. If you get someone in office who pursues evil and not good, tyranny is going to be the result. If you have a population that pursues evil and not good, their representative government is going to pursue the evil that the people <laughs> want, and it's going to be tyrannical and oppressive. Uh, governments only last if governments, um, if a population is virtuous or pursues virtue. Uh, the writings of colonist pastors reveal that they saw the spread of tyranny uh, as the spread of the kingdom of Antichrist. So listen to the words of Jonathan Mayhew. Uh, Jonathan Mayhew um, is, I don't, I don't think that um, Glenn Sunshine mentions him. There, there's a, a book out by, uh, actually this isn't on your notes, Gerald uh, Stewart, Gary Stewart, called Justifying Revolution, the Ameri American Clergy's Argument for Political Resistance. Uh, he goes into detail on Jonathan Mayhew's writings. Jonathan Mayhew, not a Christian, it, it doesn't appear, um, but a pastor, colonist pastor during this time, wrote this. And listen, um, this is sort of the, the, has been uh, uh, an eventuation, if you will, 
of biblical thought on the subject of Christian resistance now for uh, centuries, and this is coming out in the colonies. So uh, although we may differ with Mayhew's doctrine on other points, I think we would agree with his doctrine on this point. Thank you, brother. So listen to Mayhew. If, instead of attending continually upon the good work of advancing the public welfare, if they attend only upon the gratification of their own lust and pride and ambition to the destruction or the harm of the public welfare, if this be the case, it is plain that the apostle's argument, Paul's argument, Romans 13, for submission does not reach them. They are not the same, but different people persons from those whom he characterizes. In other words, the, what Paul characterizes in Romans 13 is not this guy, it's someone who is acting justly before God, right? A minister of God for good, not for evil. He says, it is blasphemy to call tyrants and oppressors God's ministers for good. That's what you're doing if you call Nero God's minister for good. Now, he's not a God's minister for good, he's a tyrant and an oppressor. They are more properly the messengers of Satan to buffet us. No rulers are properly called God's ministers, but such as are just ruling in the fear of God. When once magistrates habitually act contrary to their office, they immediately cease to be the ordinance and ministers of God and no more deserve that glorious character than common pirates and highwaymen. All right? Uh, that's a, an important distinction to make. And again, the thinking is, it's the institution, the constitution, the civil authority, the government that is in place at the consent of the governed, and not the particular pirate or highwayman that is occupying that office unjustly, okay? And our resistance to that pirate or highwayman is not a violation of Romans 13, it's in support of Romans 13, okay? I want us to see that it was as, um, it was professing Christians Resisting tyranny in keeping with biblical principles and convictions that in part led to the American Revolution. Okay? It was a resistance against tyranny uh, that led to the American Revolution. The 18th century American Revolution, in other words, was fought on the basis of a developing theology of Christian resistance. It was in the vein of that Christian resistance that had begun on the other side of the pond in the 16th century um, under persecution, uh, in, under the, in the 17th century, both here and there, and finally in the 18th century resulting in the revolution. And again, that was against absolutism and against, same vein, against the absolutist view of Romans 13. Um, we're going to give more examples of that next week when we get into um, the writings of colonist pastors. Uh, and we're going to put together uh, from their writings, adding our own thoughts, uh, theology of Christian resistance. Ben, get some questions and then we'll uh, wrap up today for next week. Yes. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering who would ever qualify then as God's minister for good? Yeah, very good question. And here, here's the... the um, this came out in the thought of the colonists too. Was it, it wasn't one time. So let's say, you know, Mayor Novito acting in accord with her office, uh, doing what she's supposed to do to uphold religious freedom, to preserve and protect unalienable, unalienable rights given to us by God. She's doing all the things that she's supposed to do, but she's an unbeliever. Um, that's possible with civil authority. It wasn't expected that civil authority would be um, uh, entirely uh, occupied by genuine Christians but they have a mandate from God to act justly and to do what civil authority is meant to do, which is to be God's minister for good, protecting God's people from evildoers, okay? So as long as they act in that, uh, with that mandate, um, that's fine. The, the issue came up is like, when do they become, when do we label them as tyrants and oppressors? And really, um, um, it was added, initially it was uh, like you heard Mayhew, when at once they immediately act against their, mandate. They become tyrants and oppressors. What was added to that thought was their habitual practice. If it becomes in, it could be in one area, could be, you know, we don't have to wait for several areas, but if, um, for example, our government acts tyrannical and oppressive in one area, it's in that area that we resist, and it's by habitual action of tyranny and oppression in that area that we label them tyrannical in that area, right? It, it um, they would say, the colonists would say more than once, and uh, an habitual practice. And if you were able to resist in an area, then you resist in an area. If it becomes um, impossible to resist in one area, you resist 
in all. And that's what the American colonists, this was a government that was uh, out of control, um, overstepping their bounds in multiple ways. And so what began then um, in their theology of Christian resistance was a defense of their life, a defense of their liberty, a defense of their property, a defense of their right to pursue happiness, well-being, virtue. And so um, in self-defense, they waged an offensive war. As you and I were talking about that a couple of weeks ago, right? When do do you, when does it (laughs) make the switch, if you will, from strictly defensive to offensive? And the way the colonists viewed that was um, um, through self-defense, for the purposes of self-defense, they wage an offense. That was going on in, in Europe, too. The Huguenots did that. Um, obviously, the, um, the um, parliamentarians in England, England did the same thing, waged an offensive war. You had uh, John Knox storming the castle in Scotland uh, uh, as, a, as an act of Christian resistance, right? Um, so does that answer your question some? We'll see, we'll see it more in the writings next week. We'll look at those in more detail. Last minute questions before we close? Closing the slate. Yeah, Oliver. What are the current encroachments that you see that we need to resist? Yeah, that's an ex- extremely good question, and we're going to get to that very soon. <laughs> there are many, many ways, uh, many, many ways, and I think um, many, many ways that we uh, could and should uh, answer as the church biblically. And so but we're, we'll let, that's going to be when we begin to wrap everything up for ourselves. I think we're going to, we're going to look at that specifically. So give me, give me a couple more weeks and we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Hopefully this is helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll, we'll talk. Let's pray. Uh, before we pray, we just want to remind you, we're, again, we're, we're shooting for 945. Um, um, Transitions class, I couldn't remember the name of the class. Transitions class, parents and kids, families, please sit in the, the back rows so we can get them out smoothly during the service. Um, again, let's, let's um, approach the, the worship of God uh, with reverence and let's um, aim to do that. We're going to make moves that direction at 945. That gives you, you know, 10 minutes to begin to start moving that way. Uh, let's really shoot for about 10 minutes out to um, prepare our hearts for worship in prayer. And then we'll sing together, pray together and start the morning service. So let's just uh, take, help me to um, uh, help us to take care with how we do that uh, by helping us clear the lobby, uh, get conversations to a minimum about that time. Uh, work with me on that so we can um, make sure that we're, we're doing that in a way that honors the Lord. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. Um, help us Lord again to understand as we seek to, um, consider our own theology of Christian resistance, our own public theology as it were, uh, and to do that in a way that honors you, that is, um, submitted to our civil authorities you've called us to be, um, but not esteeming civil authority more highly than we esteem you. Uh, but just to esteem you uh, most highly, ultimately, above all, and to honor you and how we obey the civil authority. Uh, help us to consider these things wisely with wisdom and help us to uh, apply these things to our own circumstances with uh, knowledge and with wisdom. For your glory, God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.